everyone. I'm Melinda Green. I'm a resident of Somerville's Ward 2 and a member of Our Revolution on behalf of ORS and Just Us Somerville. It is my genuine pleasure to welcome Helena Fontes, who is running for Governor's Council in the 6th District. She is joining us tonight from her home in Lynn, which is also part of the 6th District because the 6th District is really big, <laughs> um, which she can just talk a little bit about. Um, and I don't know if everyone here is familiar with Governor's Council, which is a very big shame. I did not know what this was until three years ago. Um, and it has tremendous responsibility in the state. And um, Helena, you know, I would rather have Helena talk about it than me say anything. So um, if you would like to tell us about you know, how you found out, how you came to be a candidate, um, that would be awesome. All right, yeah, thank you, Melinda. I'm really excited to be here. This is my first forum, really exciting. So um, my story basically is uh, I have a son who's now um, almost 23. When he was around um, 15, he started having a lot of mental health challenges and I really sought help um, in many different places, um, outpatient, therapy um, and there were ex real extremely long waits six to nine month waits um, I got to a point at one point of the journey where it was just so much and it was his behaviors were really a concern and I went and I called up the local DCF office here in Lynn and I said my son is really struggling I need some help and I was told um, by the woman on the phone that unless he was um, in imminent danger to himself or to others, um, there was no, like nothing they could do in that moment. Um, within a week, my son um, came into contact with the justice system and he was incarcerated and placed in a DYS facility. What I discovered after that um, incarceration was that one leads to more incarcerations I'll never forget, I remember sitting in the courtroom during uh, his sentencing hearing during for his second incarceration, and his defense attorney had prepared um, a dissertation to present to the judge that contained our all of our family history, everything from my childhood to all that I'd accomplished um, at that point. And I remember sitting in the courtroom and the defense attorney started reading and what was particularly hurtful to me was the emphasis that was placed on my childhood trauma, um, the fact that I grew up um, in foster care and that I came from really uh, rough beginnings. And the messaging I was hearing was, you know, we're here today, and it's this woman's fault. And I left there that day, and this was the defense attorney, and I said, wow. Uh, this really painful as I, I hearing that and then watching my son taken away handcuffed and shackled I just said I've got to do something like I don't know what but I want to do something so um, I'm in an eMERGE training program fast forward to um, January of 2020 and uh, eMERGE training is for um, democratic women and it really equips and uh, prepares you to run for office and the first weekend of training, they were going through all the different offices and we came to the governor's council and I said, wow, uh, there's a body of um, individuals who are elected who appoint our judges, clerks and parole board officers. That's, that's where my passion is. And so um, without really giving it much thought, I obviously I gave it some thought, but I said, that's, that's it. That's what I want to do. And I, I always joke with people, and uh, it's part of it's kind of funny, but it's also a lot of it's, uh, you know, sincere. I'm not an aspiring politician. I really see myself and my role in the governor's council as one is more of like um, from the lens of uh, someone who's lived it, lived experience as a family member, as well as someone who has um, a background in mental health, which uh, really a lot of uh, individuals um, 
uh, have been impacted and incarcerated who may have been more appropriately served in community settings. I, I think my draw to the council is not just what it is, right? So it does, um, the council's an eight member elected body um, that vets and approves our judges, clerks and parole board officers. Um, but I think in addition to that, like I really see the potential for so much more. And I look at the composition, I'll get into why I see that in a moment. Um, I come from a nonprofit. I'm the director of a mental health program. And I think anyone knows that, and especially in, in, in any like nonprofit board, I'll use that as an example, you need to have diversity of perspective on there, right? Because Massachusetts composition is so diverse, you have so many populations. And so you need individuals who have lived experience, just like a nonprofit board, you might have someone with legal experience, someone with finance, it should be no different um, in our um, judicial system, particularly where there are so many inequities. So I'll stop there just to see if I answered that question, because I'm really excited about it and I can go on forever. No, you did. You did great. I think it's, um, you know, if you could talk more, um, I know I've heard, you know, your story before, um, and I think the part that um, also really gets to me is that, you know, you have a background, you are a program director, you work in mental health, and probably just, just the helplessness you had to have felt when it was your son, mm -hmm. um, and that um, just really um how um can you tell us a bit more about your back you know your background with work because right now the council is basically lawyers the private yes. practice and mm -hmm. that's about right. it and that shouldn't be a requirement to be on this something that a body that makes these decisions um so if you want to speak more about that that would be great Absolutely. So, and I've actually, um, in doing my research, I've definitely come across um, some statements made by um, some on the council that would say um, only attorneys are uh, should be serving on the council because they um, have the um, backgrounds and expertise to like really thoroughly vet the credentials and experience of nominees. I I will dispute that for the simple fact that prior to nomination, um, individuals go through uh, a very extensive screening through the Judicial Nominating Committee, um, where their experience, training, qualifications are all thoroughly vetted. So by the, by the time they get to the council, I think it's a great opportunity to evaluate, um, like really focus on them as individuals looking at their background, their values and beliefs. And the reason being is because these judicial appointments, I mean, you're making decisions, the very nature of it, right? Judge, judgment, like you're making decisions about individuals that are going to impact not just individuals, but families and communities. So it's important that they be looked at and vetted, particularly for implicit biases. And I talk about this a lot. And implicit biases are subconscious and there are stereotypes and thoughts and beliefs that affect our attitudes and decisions about others. And every, I mean, so everyone, there's many groups that can experience them. They are prevalent. Um, and so I don't, when I say implicit biases, I mean, um, not just against minority groups, although I think, you know, with all the reform discussions and policing, we see that, um, but also um, against individuals like low-income communities, persons experiencing addiction um, or disability of any kind, and perspective is key. And so when I, questions to really get at that and to pull that out, someone standing before your bench what do you, and let's say they're there on prostitution charges, do you see a prostitute or do you see someone who might be struggling with um, maybe um, unemployment, um, homelessness, because that's, that matters, right? It matters because if you see a prostitute, you've just taken the humanity or if you see a defendant or if you see a criminal, 
um, you that person doesn't have like it you take in their humanity and it just reinforces those biases that we already carry and if you're seeing a human being empathy is key because the same individuals that have the power to incarcerate can also be um, pointing people and steering them in the direction of community um, resources that are actually going to be helpful and beneficial. Whereas incarceration, there is no treatment in those facilities. They're punitive in nature and they exacerbate a person who's already suffering. And I think there's a big, I don't see very much, you know, community, Obviously, the dis, you know the districts are quite large. Um, the um, I don't the um, I don't really know how much governors council you know counselors actually you know how much interaction they do have with the community or how much knowledge of that since um, the districts are so big um, and they are appointing judges all across the state. Um, and I bring that up just because that's the main thing they do. Um, I know Charlie Baker. I don't believe he is yet. Um, they're also governor's council is also responsible for approving um, sentence commutations yeah. and pardons. I do not believe that he has done any in his entire now like one and a half terms in office. Yeah. Um, which is um, and there's with, with the whole, with the current makeup of the governor's council, which is um, I know it's it's white. It's entirely mm -hmm. white. Yes. Um, there's also, you know, I think I don't, but most every attorney that's on there has a private practice. Um, I yes. know. I there. Yes. So of the six, so of the seven members currently in the council, five are, uh, have a legal background, are private practice attorneys, right? And they're all um, saying they represent one group and they're all roughly in the same age range. And so I think you do need you know, some representation, but again, uh, when we're looking at like in, inequities and inequalities in our systems, some of that really points to negligence of representation, right? You need to have um, the individuals who are impacted by these systems at the table. The first sentence in governor's council is to advise and consent, right? So consent, your vote, yes. Um, yes or no to appointees advise and that's key like bringing up and raising issues and saying hey baker or whoever comes after um why aren't we commutating any sentences why aren't we looking into this right so it really has to be something like it's 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 in there and it can be done but it's just not being done and honestly why is representation so important because um there's when you experience something it just kind of puts this fire in you right it kind of motivates you you you've experienced it you know firsthand the impacts of you know whatever experience it is so you have to have that on the council you have to have minority groups individuals um with disabilities mental health like just like anywhere else they have um, a plethora of experience and perspective it has especially now we know reform is needed um, at every level. So particularly in the justice system, in our courts. I mean, we're sending people to prison because they, they can't afford lofty bails because they're sick and suffering um, or because we have an, a biased fear. And I think we, we can do better. We should be doing better. Yeah, one day, I know that you have, um, also, going back a little bit to the um, what the makeup of the council now, which mostly does serve, does have their own private practices um, and probably their own interests that they're serving on by serving on the council. Um, I know, which I can point out to the audience, um, you have, um, I believe you have refused to return any contributions from certain groups. Um, if you want to speak to that at all, that would be. Oh yeah, so again, like what I'm thinking about, um, just the potential of the obstruction of justice, right? I think of, because I, what I found, I think particularly alarming when I was doing my research is that not only do we have attorneys with private practices who would boast on their, um, you know, like their 
literature that I've appointed and, and voted, um, you know, a hundred judges across the Commonwealth, there is absolutely no legislature that prohibits them from turning around in their private practice time and appearing before these individuals that they've just appointed on the bench. And I think the case going back, right, I'm going to use a recent case with Ahmad Arbery, um, in those relationships and how complicated they were um, because the DA um, had a relationship um, with the defendant in that case and, and he had worked. And so they get really complicated and it delayed justice in that case. The situation happened and then two months later, um, so a, a third party had to get involved. So really I pride myself on being um, like, one, my mental health background versus legal, because we have enough representation, legal representation on there. And then two, just being an outsider. So I'm not in these circles. I'm not in and out of courts. I'm, I'm, I come from a different background. And I think that really works um, to the advantage of um, the constituency, the individuals that I'll be representing in District 6. I believe it will make me um, able to vote fairly and objectively because that's important. And I, I intend to, well, we'll get into that in a second, but I, I have aspirations, not just vetting, but I have some great ideas about, um, you know, the process going forward and what can be done. So when we get there, I'll talk about it. Um, so, oh yeah, so to answer your question, um, no law firms. <laughs> <laughs> I've said, no, I'm not going to um, take donations, uh, lo particularly large donations from private law firms, because again, these individuals may at some point be appearing before the council, right, um, looking for um, nomination and appointment, um, and real estate firms. Um, I really want to keep myself unbiased in that way, objective, and really focused on the interest of the constituents, not the special interest of uh, whoever may need to come through the council. So when you, um, when, you know, we talk a lot, you know, because it's so much about recruit, you know, judges. Um, I want to mm -hmm. talk a little bit about, um, you know, not just the judges, but also then member of the parole board or any of the other boards that they do, you know, um, how, what will you use to determine the merits of the people that come before you? What sort of cri you know, criteria, because um, which you kind of just alluded to with great ideas that you have, you know, just more than vetting. Um, because I, I think now there's a, as you said, there's a definite need to review records and actions. Um, is there any thought, you know, that you have um, sort of, um, you know, whether it's some specifics about character, backgrounds, values, that sort of thing, if you want to. Yeah, so I'm all, I think uh, for me, it's really important, like you have to really dig into what their beliefs are, right? Because it's important, um, whether they're on the parole board or whether they're serving in a judicial seat or clerk seat, uh, again, like how do you see the world? Because if, if you're someone that's coming in um, to like Lynn, we'll say, right? Lynn is a very diverse community, or even Somerville. Somerville is as well. Um, I always want to prioritize individuals that are representative of that community and understand the unique um, challenges and the dynamics between community and police, because that's important. However, if the individual is not from the community, what have not just what have they said but how have they demonstrated a commitment to understanding what's happening in the community um, and so that's where for me there's nothing in the massachusetts constitution that says you can't like get a commitment like i i want to first of all bring transparency to the process right you're as a governor's council you're able to um, vote and vet as you so choose. <laughs> I <have a> catch. <laughs> <Are you? laughs> oh no, that was awesome. Um, so um, you're at liberty to ask whatever questions you want. There's no standard. Um, and you're also um, at liberty to vote, right? 
I want, I don't want to just go freely give away my vote because you may have legal experience. I want a commitment from you. Can you commit to me that you are going to, um, really, you're going to um, lean towards diversion? Can you commit to me that um, you are going to be objective and fair in writing? Like there is nothing that says you can't do that, right? Those are the kinds of things I want to do. I want to be, get commitments from people before they get my yes vote demonstrated um, dem e a demonstrated commitment um, that they are going to really um, use their power and whatever role you're in the judicial system um, to really like keep people in community community integration because that's where the resources and supports are whenever possible um, and that's where the support is that's where the help is we know prisons just make things worse oh um, how would you use this position to help end mass incarceration in Massachusetts? Well, I think, again, um, really like a commitment. The council is only as good as its quorum. So one individual alone going in, if you have others who are not like-minded, it's going to be really hard to make that change. However, right now, um, I'm really hopeful um, because I have read um, comments from other counselors, Devaney, Jubinville, who are saying like, hey, we've, we, everyone that comes through, we just vote in, like they find that problematic. We're just giving away our yes votes. Like we don't, we never even have a tie. So it's really about like allying with others, right? Relationship building, because there's so much you can do. I, I was reading um, an article in the Herald from 2018 where there was some frustration because a single nomination comes to the council. So they're not involved, like when they're going through the JNC, the council's not involved, so they just get the individual that has been vetted and comes through. And so they feel powerless because we just get the single nominee. However, there's, oops, are we running out of time? Oh, oh no, no, that was my, I. <laughs> okay, I was like, oh. <laughs> So, I mean, that may seem like a challenge, but I mean, my thinking is, okay, again, you can make a clear stand as a council and say, you know, look, Governor Baker, we are, this is what we want for this community. We want um, someone who's, I'll use Lynn, who's biracial, bilingual. We want someone, you know, in this area because we know there's lots of qualified individuals from all over. Um, in many of the, the communities um, that have open seats. So you can make that kind of stand and say, well, you're not gonna get a vote. As long as you have the quorum, um, we take the stand that we're not gonna vote unless you get us what we need. So I know it hasn't been done, but it doesn't mean that it can't be done. There's a lot of things that aren't currently being done. I think, again, it goes to the, we're all, we all know each other, we're, we're all running in the same circles. So that's why I think you get uh, tempted to maintain the status quo. But we can't maintain the status quo anymore because there's too many communities, um, communities of color, um, communities of, um, oh, I say black and brown, communities of color, because I recently was speaking to a group and who educated me, black and brown, communities of color, individuals with disabilities, low income, were being impacted. Um, and not that others aren't, but w there's um, research and stats that shows that we are being harmed at a disproportionate rate. So we have to, we can't maintain anymore. We have to do better. We have to create change. Um, and I see this as, uh, when we're thinking of reform, this is definitely uh, an area that we have needs reform as well. We have to get in um, judges who are empathetic to our needs. Have you, um sat in on any of the sessions since deciding to run? I know they are open to the public like noon on Wednesdays or sat on any of those new meetings, anything like that? So I actually had, um, I right in February, I started like <laughs> putting in my schedule. I said, oh boy, I've, I've got to go because prior to that, I was just watching them online um, and I had them scheduled in for April and then COVID-19 came and I was like, oh, 
So I have not been to one in person. However, I have been, I know for a while they were not convening as um, like in the early um, onset of COVID, but recently have been. So I have made it a point to, um, even if I'm not logged in at that moment, going back and just reviewing just to see what they're working on and what appointments are going on, so. What else do you want to do? You want to say, you know, what else do you want to tell us about your campaign? I know there's obviously challenges with COVID, um, especially for a first-time candidate as yourself. <laughs> it's kind of got, you know, I'm gonna run for governor's council. Oh, pandemic! Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, how has that been? Is there anything you want to tell tell people? I'll just say, um, so a pandemic was never in the plan. And I see like COVID because all of a sudden it was like, I had all these plans, all these events, all these meetings, and here came COVID, right? And I'm grateful in a way because it's, it's like a trial by fire, right? Because I, I'm driven by the change and the passion that to make this change. So COVID tested that. It was kind of like, do you want to create change? And okay, how bad do you want it? Um, and so parts of me that, I may have like known we're there, like have really like, you know, come out like just the termination and just the mother of the person with lived experience is like survivor, right? No matter what, we're gonna get it done. Um, so in that I'm like really proud and I'm proud to, to still be in the, in the race. Um, I think for myself and my own experiences, just to really drive home my point, I, I, I can say um, from my own life, I am someone who I mentioned in the beginning, I come from a pretty rough beginning. And I am fortunate enough to be someone who, um, although it took me uh, many years, was able to find support and tools and resources that I need for my own recovery journey that did not include incarceration. And so again, incarceration, um, it hurts and it harms and it exacerbates and it creates um, recidivism It leads to more incarcerations. It's extremely costly to taxpayers. And there are other ways, and it's $90,000 uh, annually to send someone to prison. That's what Massachusetts spends. And I, I think there are better ways, individuals, um, Everyone, like when we see the world, we're a combination of nature and nurture. And our perspectives are shaped by our life's experiences, our environments, and then who we are, our um, heritage, hereditary. Um, heritage, I can't even think of the word. Sorry, it will come to me. It's fine. Hereditary. All right, I'm not even gonna try. I got that. <laughs> So, however, when given support and tools and resources, people can not only recover, but they can go on and contribute in very meaningful ways. And I, I think we should treat, again, our most vulnerable and marginalized populations in Massachusetts with more care and more support. And we, we can do better, we have to do better. And keeping people in communities and reinvesting in communities um, pays bigger dividends than incarceration. Um, so that's, that's really why I'm here. Thank you so much for being here. I mean, well, do, you know, running, because, um, you know, I speak for myself and, um, Go, you know, speak for organizations I'm part of, but um, that it's we need more people like you running, um, especially for governor's council, which doesn't always really get the attention it deserves. Um, so I, it's, yeah, it's really important that you're doing this and also educating people about what the council is. Um, so this has been great. Um, if you want to add anything else, you know, your, um, your website or anything so people can find out more. Um, it's, do I have it open? It's um, alinafontes.com. Um, alinafontes.com, yeah, that yeah. is.
my website. There you can find the link to my Facebook page. Um, if you're interested in learning more, all of my contact information is there. Um, I definitely, I've been really trying to stay on top of like everyone who wants to reach out. Some people have more questions, they have ideas. Um, let's talk about it because I'm learning a lot on this journey as well. Um, hearing from different groups and how, you know, they're being impacted. Um, this is something I love to talk about. You'll probably have to you know, tell me to your recommend <laughs> on me. Um, but yeah, anything you want to know, need to know is there. Um, and if you want to get involved and volunteer, um, helping me spread the word because um, I hear too much. What? What does the governor's council <laughs> change? That has to change. They are elected to represent us and our interests. So we have to be holding them accountable and being staying on top of what they're doing and what they're voting and asking. What are you asking? We have a right to know. So yeah, we, we have to be paying attention. So if I get that accomplished, I'll be really excited. And either way, I'm not going away. I'm still going to be telling everyone, hey, the governor's council, I'm going to be screaming off the rooftops until I can't scream anymore. <laughs> I hope that's not anytime soon. I don't know. Thank you very much. Um, I no. think that's done here.